All right, open your Bibles to Acts 10. Now this world is a mess. Nothing new. It's been that way for 6,000 years. I've said it enough. And by the way, this is another change of mind message. As I was saying, I've said it enough over the years that the only solution for this world is Jesus. Not man, but Jesus. Not angels, but Jesus. He is the solution. His kingdom will come and set things straight. But until then, He's allowed us. He has given us the opportunity to play a part in the solution. Not that we can solve it. We're not the problem solvers of this world. But we can lead people to who, who is. He is the the problem solver. He's more than that, but he's the only solution, the only hope. And as I said, he will set things straight. But he's allowed us to be part of the solution. He's allowed us to be servants that's faithful in presenting not only him but the solution that he will provide in this massive train wreck that we find ourselves in in this world. So in a sense and some might get offended by this but in a sense, God needs you. Now, God being God, He doesn't need any of us. He can wipe us all out. Start all over and accomplish what He wants to accomplish. There's been many times I've asked myself, why didn't He do it? When you look how sick and evil this world can get. But God needs you. God needs me. Well, that sounds pretty arrogant. I'm not the one that set the plan in motion. It was him that did that. It was him. You understand here in a minute. I've read through Romans 10, verses 14 and 16, where it says, How can anyone hear unless someone preaches to them. Remember the verse? Hebrews 10, 7, 15, Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. God could have just chose a certain amount of people, plant His Holy Spirit in them, where they respond, without hearing any of the Word of God, but somehow acknowledge that there is a God. He is the only true God. There is no other God. He's the one we should pray to, worship, and our trust should be in Him. But that's not how He chose to do it. The Gospel needs people. When you read through Paul's 
letter in Acts, you have a pretty good illustration of that. There, the gospel is delivered from people to other people. People via people. And the vast amount of believers converted from whatever they were following to following Jesus as a result of the personal sharing of the gospel in those New Testament early days. It's still true today. Yeah, I know there's going to be some outliers out there that just pick up the Bible and they became believers. But if all cases, if not all, if in all cases, if most cases, if not all cases, someone usually played a role in bringing them to the faith, including whoever printed that Bible, if they were a Christian. Whoever supported the print of that Bible, if they were a Christian. What's the point of this? The point is that we need people. No, he needs people to present the gospel. You go to Acts 10. And I'm going to read through the verses quickly. I'll start with verse 1. There was a certain man of Sisera called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house. Which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked up on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants, and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry, and he would have eaten, but while they were made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending upon him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let them down to the earth. Wherein, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. Quite an assortment, if you really think about it. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God had cleansed, that call not thou common? Call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was free, received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, and doubting nothing, for I have sent them. 
Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from the Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he who ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of the good report among all the nation of the Jews, were warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into this house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in, and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen, and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come into another nation. But God had shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That was the purpose of the vision. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, and soon as I was sent, for I asked therefore what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms are, are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and called hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house, after, what, house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God, to hear all things are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, is Lord of all. The word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism when John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost, People are always wondering, what should I tell people? Well, here you have an example, a good one, in the following verses from 38 to 44. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost, and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with them. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto the witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To give him, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Take note there in verse 43. It doesn't say whoever repent and remorseful of their, remorseful of their sins. Does it? This is where the change of mind understanding comes in at what you really need to do to be saved is to change your mind about Jesus trust in what he did for you what was just explained here and he rose up on the third day and showed him openly he rose from the dead he did what he said he was going to do and he did it for us to, get, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, pisteo is the Greek there, whoever trusts in him and shall receive remissions of sins. You trust that he did forgive and remove your sins. What he did at Calvary was sufficient. Another substitute is necessary. Another God, false God that is, could have done that. 
In verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. All you can do, some of you get disappointed when you tell somebody what Jesus, you don't have to tell what Jesus did for you, just tell them what Jesus does, period. Whether they like to hear it or not, they need a Savior. They're a miserable sinner. You know how to approach a person because you understand the relationship you have with them. You could rephrase it in a different way, but the message has to be the same. Some, are, some people are more delicate than others. Just rephrase your approach, but don't change the principle. Don't change the message. Don't change the gospel message. Don't add anything to it. And definitely, in order for you to be saved, you have to believe in Jesus, plus you have to do this and that and whatever. That is a false gospel. That is another gospel. In this case, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them, which heard the word. So when you preach the gospel, it may fall on deaf ears, and most times it will. But you never know what ear will finally receive it, and the Holy Ghost will come into that person, because why? They heard the word. They're not going to hear the word unless they heard it from someone. That's why the gospel needs you, not just in your own sharing experience, but in the support of someone that's getting it out there. Churches, ministries, whoever is doing that missionary work. And the whole planet is a missionary situation. You don't need to go to a foreign country to do missionary work. The gospel needs to be heard and received the Holy Spirit falling on people which heard the word. This Gentile named Cornelius, obviously he abandoned worshiping other idols and he became a God-fearing man. That's what we just read here in the story. His everyday habit became of one of praying he occasionally fasted, and in this case, as he was fasting and praying, maybe asking God, who knows what he was fasting and asking God for. Maybe he was asking God for some clarity. Maybe he heard that you need to be saved. What does that mean? Well, an angel came to him, that's who came to him, and it told him, and told him to send for Simon, which was Peter. Now, I want to make a point right there. If God chose angels to deliver the message, this angel would have done it. But God did not choose angels. God chose you. And because He established the plan, the method, of how people would become saved by hearing the Word of God and then the Holy Spirit descending upon him because they start trusting and believing that there is some truth or there is a lot of truth or this is just the truth. But it starts with you. It starts with me. It the, starts with sharing and supporting. God could have chose angels that angel could explain probably better than anyone else what the gospel was all about. But that was never God's intention. It is people that he chose to relay the gospel to other people. So what happened? Cornelius sent for Peter. Peter came and he delivered, short and simple by the way, a gospel, the true gospel. And the end result, Cornelius and his household became saved. So that means the gospel is shared, shared peer to peer. 
P-E-R, P-E-R, to pair, peer to pair, is not shared by angels to humans. It's shared by people to people. And I asked the question at the close of the last service concerning whether everyone should share the gospel. And you hear it behind the pulpits continuously that everyone should be sharing the gospel. Yeah, in theory, you could say that's correct. It's a good practice. It's a great idea. But let me give you my answer to that question. I disagree. I don't believe every Christian should be sharing the gospel. And I said, I say Christian loosely. Why? Why is that? Because people will share what they think is the gospel. What if Catholics are called Christians? Use them for example. I'm not trying to pick on the Catholics, but I'll use them for example. What if they, I was trained to pray to saints? That was part of the gospel when I was a young boy in the Catholic religion. And if you do that, you're saved. After I went to confession, where well, I would make up sins because I went to Catholic school and you had to come up with new sins all the time. Even if you think they were in sins, you made up sins like I did. And you would get to so many Our Fathers and Hail Marys and occasionally you were told to pray to different saints also. And you be forgiven of your sins. What if the Catholic is sharing that's, that's the gospel message? That's my point. They shouldn't be sharing. They don't have a gospel message. They have another gospel message. They don't have the true gospel message. I don't want that person sharing what they think is the gospel. It sure is not the change of mind gospel that I preach. I think it does more damage than good. Even though in principle it's true that everyone should share the gospel because the gospel does need to be shared. I only want people. I believe God only wants people who under understands the true gospel to share it. If you listen to the Change of Mind series, you would come to the same conclusion that most people are not ready to share or talk about what God requires for our salvation. They don't get it right. Why? Because they misunderstood the basic fundamentals. I'm not going to review that now, but I encourage you to read or listen to the Change of Mind series. If you're a gospel sharer, sharer, there's only two criteria that need to be met. Only two. One, you've got to be breathing. You've got to have the right kind of DNA. You have to have, be an atom-like DNA creation. Can't be an angel or anything else. Can't be any kind of cherubim, seraphim, archangel, any other kind of angel. So you need the right kind of DNA 
and you need the right message. You need the right saving message. Close does not get it. To be effective in your gospel sharing duties, you have to have the right message, folks. And because you have the right DNA, you're halfway there. The second step, the right message, needs to be understood. And it can't be changed, altered, or add to. You need to understand the gospel. And that's why I want to read through all of Acts 10, because in Acts 10, it gives you an outline of what Peter did. He tells, you, he tells you what Jesus did while he was walking this planet, and he tells them that we were witnesses to it, and he tells them that he hung on the tree, and God raised him on the third day. And whoever believeth, verse 43, don't complicate it, don't make it confusing, just preach and share. Whosoever believeth, whosoever puts their trust in him and what he did at Calvary, in him shall receive remissions of sin. And the Holy Spirit will either fall on them or at that time or maybe it won't. That's up to God. But it requires all to share the word, to share about what Jesus did. It requires the one doing the sharing to understand that God requires a person to be willing to be a participant so others can have salvation. If you're clear about the message, you can be part of the solution. God has given us all that opportunity in the capacity that we were called to participate. You could be a part of the solution even in the Christian world. Many of them are drinking muddy water when they should be drinking clear living water. And that's what I'll pick up next time in the next Change of Mind message. I want that to seek in. Because you're not going to hear many people say this. But in the way the, gore, the way that God set up the process of how the salvation would get out, it requires you. So as I began, God needs us. And I repeat, God being God, He doesn't need any of us. But that's not what He set up. That's not what He implemented. His plan was us to be part of the solution. We can't be saviors, but, but being a part of the solution is directing Him towards who is the Savior. Now He has demonstrates our trust in Him for what He's done for us and we're willing to share it to others. But it's also given us an opportunity to earn inexhaustible eternal rewards. 
And eternity is a, is a very long time. And I repeat, God needs you. And no one wants to be excluded, by the way, where the true gospel message goes to. I don't care if you're a Buddhist, you need to hear it. I don't care if you are Muslim, you need to hear it. I don't care if you're a Hindu, you need to hear it. I don't care if you're a Christian, you still need to hear the true gospel, not another gospel. What we need is laborers to enter in the field and start harvesting. Will you be one? Let me know. Play the song. <laughs>